And in this case, there's not really a good abbreviated lecture um, necessarily that we're going to use. So we're going to use the uh, textbook lecture. Now, this lecture is abbreviated in the sense that we're I've removed some slides from my version. We're still gonna go in the order of the version you downloaded, but we're gonna remove some slides from my version that are all background information that I'll leave for you to, to review on your own, but we'll cover the important bits. And so for toxicology, we're talking about poisoning and overdose. And that could be involving, you know, somebody poisons and overdoses themselves as the means of suicide, so a behavioral issue. That could be somebody who's exposed to something unknowingly uh, that maybe isn't trying to get themselves involved in drug use or toxic. They're in an environment that a toxic leak has happened in. So that can by itself then go to like disasters and weapons of mass destruction because multiple people have similar symptoms. They probably all got exposed, those types of things. And clearly scene safety becomes a big component of toxicology as well. So what we're going to focus on is called toxidromes, toxidromes. And toxidromes are really what you need to learn for the exams and for your practice. The other things that are in here are the nice tidbits that some EMT somewhere has come up with that'll be helpful for your practice and your scenarios, um, but not exclusively testable. So it's a pretty expansive lecture uh, because of that. So we're gonna, we're gonna bring it down a little bit. So when we talk about toxicology, really any chemical, any chemical is fair game here. So it could be drugs, alcohol, good stuff, bad stuff. Um, just, you know, some stuff is good uh, based on its concentration and bad if it, there's excess of it and so on. And so we'll talk about that. And specifically, two of the areas of poisoning that we want to focus on will be nerve agent exposure. And this is technically part of like WMD stuff, but also just New Mexico is an agricultural state. So we have some um, non-nerve agent uh, chemicals that people can expose themselves to that act like nerve agents, I guess is one way to say it. And then CO poisoning uh, certainly is a big risk um, for us as well. So one of the big kind of sweeping things is there's so many chemicals out there that we can't cover them all. And so really even a physician, a normal like ER physician, your MSEP, probably doesn't know all the de degrees of, of things that can occur based on exposure to every medication. In fact, there's a special type of physician, tox toxicologist. They're kind of hard to find, but they're toxicologists who then after their medical training as a physician go on and specialize in toxicology. And so it's a whole area of specialty, just like ER and surgery is, that somebody dedicates their life to. And even then, they still rely on databases to get information and interpret. So I say this because the expectation for you to identify everything on scene uh, is, is way more than is realistic. And so we're gonna talk about big things, but certainly how do you figure out what's on scene and what the hazard is, whether or not you've experienced this thing or been trained on this thing that you're seeing your patient exposed to is to contact poison control, okay? So um, poison control deserves a little caveat though, uh, unfortunately. So poison control is a great resource for you. However, as a resource, the problem is they're not physicians that are MSEPs. So if you call poison control and you start talking to somebody, poison control is a state-run and state-funded entity with some funding from the feds. So that means every state has a different poison control. Okay, it's not one poison control for the country. So when you call in New Mexico, poison control is routed to the poison control center at University of New Mexico School of Medicine. And so there they have people that are staffing the phone lines that then look at a database and can call manufacturers of chemicals to ask what happens and what should our rescuers know if this person ate, you know, dimethyl ethyl 12 13 42 carbon three, right? Like whatever that chemical is, they can find out who made it and what they are, have as associated injuries and treatments for it. So they're, they're not generally always physicians. And in other states, they're almost never physicians. Because of New Mexico's poison control being associated with the medical school, it does have, on occasion, physicians that are men in the line. But those physicians are baby docs. They're usually residents or med school students that are volunteering to get some hours in, and they're working there. The other folks that could be there, if it's not the students that are volunteering, are nurses, uh, EMTs, and then just people that are trained that have no medical background whatsoever. But the training is simple, how to use a computer and how to find the resources. So know that just because they're a wealth of resource and literally they may tell you 
the thing that the manufacturer recommends to do for this patient is give them syrup of Ipecac. Even if they tell you that, that's a drug, it's not in our scope of practice, they, that doesn't constitute an order, okay? So please remember, poison control is not MSEP. So if poison control tells me all about this, this chemical that my patient's exposed to, and they say the manufacturer recommends doing these things, if those things are in my scope of practice, then I'll consider doing it, but the choice is still mine, not because they said so, maybe I just realized that I could use it for that when they mentioned it, but the choice is still yours to make if it's in your scope of practice. If it's not in your scope of practice, then we can't do it. And if you're even thinking about deviating even a little bit, you need to call MSEP separately and communicate with them. Now, by and large though, the treatment that they are gonna have us do is syrup of Ipecac, syrup of Ipecac. Ipecac is um, uh, a over-the-counter herbal syrup. It's like an oily substance. And it's a syrup that immediately induces large volumes of vomiting. And the vomiting will be uncontrollable. So just Google on your own sometime on YouTube, syrup of Ipecac. There's a guy that walks around and records people drinking it and then immediately throwing up. Like, look at how violent those people throw up. And they throw up so much that it becomes an airway issue for us. So we don't use syrup of Ipecac. They may ask you to give the patient milk. And milk technically is a base, it's an alkali solution. So often when somebody's ingested uh, a uh, acidic um, substance or they've got that in their GI tract, then they're told to drink milk as a means of counteracting the acid because milk is highly alkalotic. We generally don't do that because patients that have overdosed, we usually don't allow them to have anything to eat or drink. And we may have other tools like activated charcoal that might be beneficial depending on the type of chemical uh, that we're talking about, though many acids um, activated charcoal won't work on. And then finally, they'll do things like tell you to have the patient drink a large glass of water. Okay, so again, there's risks here in just doing those things because these are what they tell lay people as well as what they tell a physician that calls poison control that doesn't have the toxicology background. So we have to take these things with a grain of salt. How you treat these folks will be largely up to you. And you'll see, aside from a few things, most of it's going to be left to support their ABCs, right? Treat their signs and symptoms because there's so many different ways that these drugs can cause physical injury to patients that we give you a broad stroke of them. But in the end, whatever you see presenting from this exposure, that's what you basically will treat in your ABCs. All right. So poison control I actually left my phone as a means of like, I really don't want to have another phone call interrupt us, even though I put everything on silent. Um, so I don't have my poison control phone number in front of me. I'm going to give it to you right now, though. Just going to search the internet. Dr. Google, can you tell me poison control's number? And here it is. 1-800-222-1222. And that number is the same nationwide, right? 1-800-222-1222. Uh, but again, it's routed to your local poison control center. Um, wherever it is you call. Just like when you call 911, you're ho hopefully routed to whatever location you're physically in versus where you know your, your cell phone is registered to. So save this in your phone as poison control. It's a resource that you're gonna need to have and to call. Um, we don't generally do much practice with it because the line's pretty busy, so they don't do a whole lot of, hey, let's practice and see what it's like, um, unfortunately. But certainly don't hesitate to call them. Again, in your mind, it's information only. I'm just getting information that I need. All right, testable slide right here. So I won't uh, necessarily be asking you about poison control aside from, you know, what it is and what you can do with the information. So this will be kind of the big slide that we first come up with that's testable. And so this is essentially the list of routes that somebody can essentially get these poisons in their body. And notice that these are very similar to the routes of administration that we learned about in pharmacology, right? The same ways that we get chemicals in the body that are drugs, we're talking about those same ways uh, for patients as well. So from this list, there's two big things to know. Number one, what is the most common route of, in, of uh, exposure to chemicals? The most common route is ingested, right? Somebody ate something, right? Intentionally or not, that's the most common route. And so ate, maybe not the right term, it's going in their GI tract. So this includes folks that swallow pills, right? So ingested poisons. The fastest route of exposure is inhale, fastest, fastest. 
fastest route of exposure is inhaled. And that shouldn't surprise us because that's literally the fastest route of drug administration is inhaled. Then IV and injection follow that. Inhale takes one to three minutes for something to start working. Ingested poisons, they're a lot slower, right? They're actually the slowest route. So if this is something that has to be digested in the stomach for then us to release the chemical into the blood, then this is gonna take 30 to 60 plus minutes to hit their bloodstream and take effect. Injected poisons, just like the route, three to five minutes with obviously IV, the fastest of that route, but you know we get pretty close to IV routes when we do something like intramuscular injections as well. Absorb poisons, these are basically like uh, transdermal, right? It's absorbed through their skin goes through their skin and then enters into the bloodstream. And so the absorbed poisons kind of varies on a few things. And so this can take uh, time periods of 15 plus minutes, but it really does depend on the chemical, right? So if we're talking about something that is water soluble, meaning that this solution with the chemical in it has mostly water associated with it, then that's gonna go into the body actually more slowly than something that's fat soluble. Fat soluble stuff like ointments and creams go through our skin faster. Anybody guess why? It's because we actually have layers of fat in our skin. And there's kind of an idea of like uh, treats or fixes like, or we say like cleans like. Notice that when you clean something that's really, really greasy in your house, uh, that usually means it's fat. We clean it with an alkali fat solution. That's what dish soap basically is. It's reconstituted to mimic the pH of fat. So this is going to generally be faster if we have fat soluble items. And that kind of goes with even vitamins, fat and water soluble vitamins and how they go through the body as well. And then certainly, though not its own route, alcohol intoxication and withdrawals does make up a big component of what we'll be talking about. Uh, these are the routes of ingestion. So that's how people get these things in their body. Now. Think to yourself as well, which route is most likely to cause me scene safety issues, right? And which route is least? Well, the least likely is ingested because you gotta take the act of getting something in your mouth. That's a pretty big commission on your part. Something could spray in your mouth, certainly. Um, hopefully we've got PPE before that, but that's a lot less likely to happen than just being in an environment where you can inhale this Maybe you don't even know it's a poisoning yet. You walk in the environment and you start breathing while you talk to that patient. Maybe now you're exposed to it. And so those, and then certainly injectable when we talk about things like bloodborne exposures and pathogens. Okay, another testable slide. So we got some terms here, poison versus toxin, substance abuse, overdose. And some of these actually will be revisited like substance abuse, uh, dependence, tolerance. Some of those things will also relate to our psychological emergencies as well. So poison is any chemical basically that has an impact on the body, uh, and that can be on physiology or anatomy, it could be uh, on both as well. A toxin is a poison uh, like chemical, they're still all chemicals, but these are poisonous chemicals that come from some type of living being, right? Plants, bacteria, um, animals, so uh, venom would be considered a toxin, uh, let's see, plant toxins, certainly there's a plenty of house plants that kids, if they eat, will get sick from, so it becomes a toxin. But you can think of plants like secreted oils from poison ivy, for example, would be a toxin and not necessarily the poison. So <clears throat> substance abuse then is to say that we're using one of these chemicals and they totally could be a toxin, right? Like somebody could abuse um, uh, magic mushrooms, right, muscarin. So magic mushrooms have a toxin that they produce as a plant, as a fungi, that then creates hallucinations. And so people could be misusing not just chemicals or poisons, but toxins as well. And they're basically using it to get some effect. Very often that effect is being high. And being high constitutes a lot of different things, but being high, euphoria, dopamine release, right, all those kind of pleasant experiences. That's what we're doing with this drug that maybe isn't intended for such things. So a good example of which we actually have treatment for is the opioid, right? So opioids are prescribed still to this day, prescribed though kind of heavily regulated. They're prescribed for patients to help them decrease their pain experience. As a side effect, it does produce euphoria. 
but we don't take it for the euphoria when it's prescribed. And so those that take it for the euphoria side of it are mis or abusing that substance. And then overdose is basically a dose of any substance. It doesn't have to be a medication, though that's where we use that term, but an amount of any substance, any chemical that then causes too many effects outside of the tolerable range. And so the toxic dose of a drug relates to a term you read in pharmacology called the therapeutic dose. And the therapeutic dose in pharmacology is the same idea, but let's use that since we're oriented with drugs already. Uh, we're, we're familiar with drugs already. I don't know if that sounds good or bad, but the therapeutic dose is the dose in which the therapeutic effects of the drug happen and above that dose usually is where overdose occurs. So it's above the therapeutic range. And so some doses, some chemicals, some are also medications truly, but some chemicals have a very small area in which their dosage range is therapeutic and not harmful. And outside of that area is totally harmful. And so a lot of drugs that are, that are prescribed to patients actually fit in that realm where if they overdose, even intentionally, if they overdose on this drug, it proves fatal very quickly with small amounts of that medication. And so I'm sure you're aware plenty of things in the environment, small doses are fatal to us, okay? So a big thing about this is gonna be scene safety, okay? There's actually literally a slide here on carfentanil, it's kind of a newer slide we've been talking about in the last few years because of the degree of overdoses. You've probably heard of fentanyl. Um, carfentanil we'll describe later, but as a kind of reason for this slide, carfentanil as we'll describe later is a very, very potent form of fentanyl and opioids. And so it's essentially the like elephant tranquilizer. It's, an, it's a large animal opioid. And so carfentanil is designed for very large animals. And so small doses of carfentanil are fatal humans. Now, fentanyl is being packaged and brought across our borders in very, very high numbers. Why? Partly because it's very inexpensive to make in places like China. And because of the legalization of marijuana in multiple states, marijuana profitability in the illicit world is going down. And so they're looking for other drugs that they can sell at a higher margin profitability and carfentanil and fentanyl are those two drugs because they can be made readily without a whole lot of other tools, unfortunately. Now I say this because the exposure can happen when you're least thinking about it. There's postal workers who accidentally handle a package that's transporting fentanyl or carfentanil in and they literally picked it up and moved it from one slot to another to be delivered and got a fine crystal substance on their fingers and then had a massive opioid overdose and some have died. Law enforcement officers are passing out when they go through evidence and they find small doses of carfentanil that aerosolize in um, powder form when they open the package, just almost as dust, they accidentally inadvertently inhale it, though they're wearing gloves, it goes into their respiratory tract and they, they get high basically very quickly, unfortunately. Some of those have had unfortunate side effects. So even if you don't know, you know, know that you're going to a toxic situation, you could be at risk of an exposure because we often find that out once we're on scene, not necessarily from the phone call. Because if you think about it, if somebody disposes something, maybe they don't know why. So they call with their signs and symptoms, not the talk of exposure. And those that do know that they've overdosed on something don't wanna bring law enforcement. So they don't call and say, my friend's overdosed on heroin. They'll call and just, oh, my friend's not breathing. He needs help, he's in shock and leave it for us to get there without law enforcement. So certainly scene safety is a huge issue. So that means expect that on our exam for this subject. Now the signs and symptoms of poisoning, they vary by specific agent and person. In general, the signs and symptoms per person will be same, but the difference will be what's their tolerance to this thing. Some people have large exposures to some things and they have a natural tolerance in which their signs and symptoms are less severe. So severity is gonna be a really big component of this. When we're assessing patients and we think, again, we probably don't know it's a poisoning yet, we think it's a poisoning, some of the questions that we can ask are listed here, right? So these are really good things for you to memorize as a focused assessment in your, in your secondary assessment, focused assessment. So just like we might focus an assessment on the nervous system, looking for signs and symptoms of stroke by doing a Cincinnati pre-hospital pre stroke scale, just like we do that focused assessment in our secondary for neuro, we have now a focused assessment that we do for toxicology. And this is kind of the list of it. So the idea here is see if you can figure out what it is they're exposed to. And even better, if you have the ability to get the container and look at the ingredients on the container 
that's what poison control is going to need. That's what you're going to need. Although they can look it up if you say uh, Ajax, it, the patient just knows the brand name. I don't have the packaging here with me. You call, they can look it up by brand name, but maybe that means different things. So the specific chemical is literally the thing that the person's suffering because of uh, in an exposure. So look on the label, right? Look at the label, take a picture of the label, transport that with you to the hospital or transport the substance if it's safe to do so. And we have the right PPE and container for it, transport the substance to the hospital, but let the physician see when you get there exactly what it is that this person ingested. Try to get an idea of how much they ingested. Have they recently vomited? Because if they've ingested something and they vomited, some overdoses cause people to vomit. And that's almost like a protective mechanism because if they vomit stuff that wasn't digested, then it gets out of their body and they don't get that level of exposure to it, if that makes sense. Meaning somebody who takes a bunch of pills, if they ingested a bunch of pills, they are likely to throw up. And if they do throw up, those pill fragments that weren't fully digested, even if part of them has been, those pill fragments equal drug that didn't get into the body. So it lessens the amount of their exposure. Is there an antidote? Did they call poison control? And what did poison control tell them to do? And did they do that after uh, afterwards before we arrived, especially if we have kind of rural long transport times as many of us will find in the field? How much do you weigh, right? So how much do you weigh is an important question. Though, if it's a poisoning that was ingested, we may need to know that for drug calculations of activated charcoal. This is actually for a different reason. When the toxicologist is consulted in the ER, when the ER doc is looking up, how do I manage this patient? Really, they are going to try and determine what was the dose for that patient that they received, right? So if somebody took, they have a pill that's 10 milligrams, and they took 10 of those pills, that would be 100 milligrams. Generally, most of the chemicals and drugs that patients take, there's known what the like lethal or overdose dosage is per kilogram of body weight. And so this will be really helpful, certainly for your charting. Maybe you have to do meds, maybe not, but definitely something you're going to need for the hospital, uh, for the ER to do their job. Obviously, giving this in advance helps them figure out how much of an antidote they might need, so on and so forth in your, in your radio report. Excellent. Though certainly you should already be getting weight on every patient to be realistic. Now here's a list of the toxidromes uh, from the textbook. So I believe technically this is table 22-1 for the 12th edition, um, but nonetheless, there's a similar table. And so the toxidromes are basically classifications in which many different things like physical products or physical things fit within a, a kind of list of uh, similarities between their toxins. And then you pair that on the table with what are the signs and symptoms for that class. So it's almost like a drug class, if you will. In fact, some of these have names that are similar to drug classes that we've already ex experienced, but not all of them are drugs. So certainly they won't all be drug classes, but that's a great way to think of it. If a patient takes an opioid, it creates predictable signs and symptoms, right? So that's a toxidrome. Opioids are a toxidrome. And so that's essentially what I want you to really get out of this chapter is knowing the toxidromes, what the signs and symptoms are, and then examples of those toxidromes. So that if you're told a patient on your exam, uh, for example, your patient has overdosed on a sympathomimetic, you should be able to recall what the signs and symptoms are of a sympathomimetic, right? And then likewise, for major things like opioids, if you're told patient overdosed on fentanyl, you should know, okay, that toxidrome is the opioid toxidrome. And this is the set of signs and symptoms. So obviously this is gonna to relate uh, to management with Narcan or Naloxone, Narcan, Narcan, and Naloxone. All right, so let's go through them. So there's this table that has a quick little, this is great for, for you to make flashcards out of or some memory tool. And then we've got slides on them that we'll talk about. All right, so we talked about that. So four major routes for us to consider. Okay, we've talked about those, talked about which is fastest. Let's start talking about substances and toxidromes. So alcohol actually kind of mimics a few other toxidromes, but really we would consider this something called a CNS depressant. Okay, that's what the hospital would consider this. So other CNS depressants, right, are things like um, benzodiazepine, Valium, right, is a good example. Benzos are CNS depressants. Uh, and then other, Toxidromes depress the central nervous system, like opioids, right? So CNS depressant means central nervous system depressant. And so that means that the body, the, the, the body's response to the brain and the brain's processing speed 
is depressed, is slowed down. So alcohol is a really great example because everybody is at least, even if everybody's not had alcohol and gotten drunk or buzzed before, everyone's probably seen the effects of somebody that's intoxicated, especially in the United States. And so in that, in that example, we can all kind of think of, oh, okay, that's CNS depression, right? Somebody who's intoxicated um, doesn't have the full mental capacity, whatever that means in varying degrees, uh, has central nervous system depressant. And that leads to the acute problems, right? People that are drinking alcohol that are acutely intoxicated, if they get behind the wheel, they won't have the right reaction time. And they're not gonna perceive the surroundings appropriately. They don't feel pain the same way. They don't have inhibition in their thought process. And so that leads to car accidents, firearm. They're more aggressive because of lack of inhibition. So violence and fights can happen. All those secondary things that we likely got called for started with the alcohol intoxication. So alcohol over time, and let me kind of be specific for us, just, you know, in case you hear this term, it's okay for charting. E-T-O-H is specifically the ethyl alcohol that we're talking about in the alcohol that we drink. There's other forms of alcohol out there, but when we're talking about alcohol here, we're really talking about E2H. And so it may be abbreviated E2H intoxication. Or someone might say on a scene, oh, they're just an E2Her. That means that that's you know, our lingo for saying that they're just drunk right now. They're just a drunk, which as I've talked about before, uh, could be your high liability call. So you need to make sure that you assess for at least a BGL uh, in these patients and lack of injury. Now, there's acute intoxication, right? So all the things that we've talked about that lead us to car accidents, to physical violence, the, those things. But there's also the effects of long-term uh, chronic overuse. And so for this, we're going to want to kind of know what happens in the long-term and the short-term. So the short-term, you're probably pretty familiar with. Although let's add to that, when binge drinking occurs, that means somebody's drinking a lot over a short period of time, and usually more than they normally would drink in that period of time. The other side effect of their CNS depression can be a loss of consciousness a depressed airway, the patient not being able to reposition themselves, so maybe they're in the, unfortunately, the prone position or on their back, supine position, but left unattended, these patients vomit, aspirate because of the lack of uh, their airway and LOC aspiration. They choke on their vomit and then that leads to respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. So that's the most severe form for that individual, right? Things can be worse for others around them, but that's more, the most severe form for that individual that this acute intoxication can occur. And that usually happens with binge drinking. But overuse of it over time is going to destroy the liver. And so these patients often end up with hepatitis, but from our GI, from our GI lecture, you know, that's just a term that means inflamed liver. How it's inflamed is a variety of things, but these patients often have their hepatitis progress, unfortunately, to cirrhosis, which is essentially the early form of cancer or liver cancer for those patients. Now, remember, not all patients that have liver disease are alcoholics, so tread lightly uh, and don't assume, um, ask questions. So here's our CNS depression. So as we know, decreases activity and excitement, makes it slower, induces drowsiness, dulls the senses, causes aggressive and inappropriate behavior, and a lack of coordination. The lack of coordination, we have a medical term. It's called ataxic. So when you imagine the drunk person trying to walk and they stumble, that's called an ataxic gait. And gait here is like the stride of how somebody walks. So when you're re reporting, right, like in your chart and you're describing these patients, an important point for your charting knowledge is that we can't say somebody's intoxicated. Like literally they have all the signs and they're drinking when you walk up. We can't say they're intoxicated in our chart. Why? Saying legally that somebody is intoxicated happens of only a few ways. One, the blood alcohol content is measured. We don't have devices to do that in the ambulance. Two, they use a breathalyzer. We don't do that in the ambulance, but law enforcement can legally claim somebody drunk because they've blown that level on the breathalyzer. And then what we do, because we have a lack of that, is we describe the things that make us suspect that they have alcohol exposure. So your charts kind of cheap um, rule out, assuming they have no other illness or injury, like literally they're just intoxicated. These patients, your rule out is likely gonna be written as suspected ETOH intoxication, not ETOH intoxication, certainly not drunk. If you use the term drunk and that goes to court, they're gonna use that as an example of libel uh, because you wrote something that is 
untrue, right? Because you can't test for it. You just suspect that they are. So with alcohol, we look for these signs. So you'll want to document all those signs. So your chart then should follow in your assessment to, to list those things, right? Odor of ETOH on breath, saying they smell like they've been drinking. Uh, um, beer bottles in car. This patient states, I'm drunk and in uh, quotations, right? For your chart, because they stated, we don't want to call them that. And you'll describe things like their ataxic gait, their pupils will probably be sluggish, but likely not unequal. They'll just be, they'll be slow to respond, but probably equal. And then you write down the patient has an ataxic gait if you saw them walk, right? So a normal gait would be how probably all of us are walking when we're not intoxicated. You, that would be a, a physical observation. Uh, ataxic gait is that kind of stumbling person. When these patients present, don't forget to get your BGL because alcoholism masks and mimics other things, including hypoglycemia, as we uh, recently talked about. Now, when patients are alcoholics, right, they abuse alcohol over a period of time, they can also put themselves at some acute things that come from their chronic alcoholism. One of those acute things is kind of the, the body's developing tolerance and dependence on alcohol, okay? So when we say a dependence, the dependence can be psychological, which we'll talk about in the behavioral emergencies, or it can be physiologic, right? So a physical dependence means that my body physically needs, depends on having that drug now to do things. And without it, my body will physically respond, okay? If you have psychological dependence, then that's the idea of withdrawals, right? Psychologic withdrawals, where people have things like break with reality or hallucinations, or they feel sick, right? If they're actually sick, that was a physical dependence. If they're psychologically withdrawing, then that's a psychological dependence. Alcohol patients get both, unfortunately. And one of the manifestations of their physical dependence on alcohol is that when they're a chronic alcoholic and they stop taking alcohol, their physical withdrawals create something called DTs. And so alcohol withdrawal is a, a, an emergency by itself. So the problem here is multifaceted, but the gist of it is that these patients' brain has now been kind of um, trained, if you will, from the chronic alcohol abuse to work at a decreased amount. So it suppresses, right? It's a depressant. It literally suppresses the rate of the conduction of our electrical neurons. That literally slows. So when patients' brain gets used to that and they stop taking it abruptly, they're going to start experiencing nervous system signs and symptoms. And so those can include things like literal, they can have tremors, in their muscles so they can have like a shake that's present. In fact, if you see that an alcoholic, expect that that tremor can progress to a seizure, right? A dangerous seizure that could be fatal for these patients, unfortunately. But in addition, their brain now firing differently is gonna produce hallucinations. And so they become delirious, hence the name. Delirium or delirious means break with reality. So it means that they're seeing things that are not real and then the tremens. So DTs left untreated will progress to this patient having seizures, going into cardiac arrest and dying because of the lack of alcohol. Now here's the catch. The patient knows that to stop their withdrawal, all they have to do is drink alcohol. As soon as they drink alcohol, their delirium tremens will stop, their withdrawals will stop. And so the patient then sees that as treatment. And in doing so, even if they wanna quit, now they feel so sick and they're scared because they realize this stuff could get out of hand. They probably have friends that have had DTs and had bad experiences. And so they start to feel those. They know if I just drink some, then I'll fix it. And they probably drink like the intent of drinking a little to start, but then it stops everything and they start feeling better because their body's used to it. And that progresses to them continuing the cycle of alcoholism. Aside from the psychological and genetic predispositions that people have, when you're in it, that's the psychological thing that keeps them going. So this is dangerous. So if patients are experiencing even early stage alcohol withdrawal or DTs, you need to consider calling ALS. Why ALS? ALS and EMS exclusively has the ability to manage seizures. Uh, intermediates could manage a seizure if the IV dextrose was the fix for the seizure, which could still be the case here as well. They could be diabetic and have a low BGL, but they don't have as intermediates any means of stopping the seizure. And it's important that the ALS stops the seizure because then that stops the progression to death. 
And so these patients, when they're in the hospital, they're actually probably going to get an IV drip of some small amount of alcohol to start weaning them off. And they'll be sedated with things that the paramedic has that are other CNS depressants like Valium to sedate this person so that they don't have the tremors, the seizures, and so on. And this may be an extended treatment for them. So we see this often, you know, pre-hospital in its emergent state. And the patient's going to want to try and drink. And it's our job to stop them, but also to get them the help they need by transporting, hopefully, to ALS to intercept along the way. Also, these patients could have increased internal bleeding if they um, have suffered trauma recently. And be in mind that if they were intoxicated and they had that ataxic gait and they lost their footing and stumbled and fell maybe last night, maybe they don't remember that they hurt themselves. So they don't bring it up when they call 911 not feeling well the next day. So be in, you know, a, a detective, investigate, ask questions about the last couple of 24 hours or so and see if there's a recent injury. And also alcoholics tend to have subdural bleeds, subdural hematomas, right? Subdural hematoma. We talked about this briefly in the nervous system lecture. We revisit it again in head trauma later because of the relationship between the leakage, it's in the same spot. So it's, it's basically the same idea, but the mechanism is usually a trauma that causes this. However, alcohol patients, when they're chronically drinking, their brain literally shrinks in size because they're chronically dehydrated. When their brain gets smaller in their cranial cavity, it pulls on their blood vessels. And when it pulls on their blood vessels, which are not designed to stretch, by the way, it makes them weak so they can tear. This coupled with, if the brain shrinks, like kind of think of, um, Homer Sim Simpson's brain. You ever watch The Simpsons and Homer Simpson's brain is like a tiny little peanut inside this big cavity. So think of that and think of the brain should be the full size, right? If it's the full size in my cranium, when I shake my head like this, the brain doesn't move because it fits nice and tightly in there. But when the brain shrinks, right? That peanut is a huge exaggeration, but the brain shrinks. If I move my head, the thing's gonna move around. And when it moves around, it tears the blood vessels. And so even small bumps on an alcoholic's head can lead to a subdural hematoma, okay? And the subdural hematoma, just as a reminder, is a venous bleed because of where it is in the meninges. And that means that it's a slow bleed with slow signs and symptoms uh, that progresses to death. All right, we'll revisit more of those head injuries, but specifically alcoholism is a risk for subdural hematomas. So here's the full list of signs and symptoms for DTs. I want you to get from this, delusions and hallucinations are associated with delirium. We're gonna compare and contrast delirium later in the behavioral emergencies. And then obviously progressive seizures and eventually respiratory and cardiac arrest. Okay, so alcohol, CNS depressant, easy. Signs and symptoms, and then we have a big risk. Now let's talk about the opioid toxidrome. So opioids are a huge focus. Everybody now knows the risk of opioids. Even if you've never been around people that do heroin or have had to take opioids yourself, everyone in the United States is aware of the effects now because of the huge epidemic uh, that we've still, we're still seeing, unfortunately. So the epidemic uh, among opioids, unfortunately, leads to a lot of premature deaths. So in the world of, of medicine and, and uh, reasons for people to die, the order of unintentional, to give you a scope of the problem. The order of unintentional deaths, according to the CDC, they track it every year, used to be this order. Number one, most unintentional deaths were from motor vehicle collisions. Number two, most unintended, unintentional uh, deaths were from, uh, from falls, accidentally falling. Number three, most unintentional deaths were from overdose, okay? So that was like a few years ago. And then, and it was that way for 30 years. And then suddenly in the uh, early 2010 era, this suddenly one year to another overtook. Now overdose is the leading cause more so than car accidents. Historically, car accidents have been the leading cause of death for, uh, death for over 30 years. Suddenly over one year period, overdoses overtook both of its predecessors to be the leading cause of unintended death. And so this means that unintended means folks that, took a little too much of their prescribed opioids, uh, on not realizing it, and then dying as a result. And those that, you know, use somebody else's or used heroin uh, as a means of getting high, they didn't intend to die, but they died of an overdose. That's how many people are dying. And who's dying? These are younger folks, right? These are folks that are in the prime and mid of their life, which would generally be dying from things like car accidents or now dying prematurely 
uh, from overdoses. Now, um, I, I would suspect that virtually everybody has a connection to somebody that has overdosed on an opioid. Like in your family and friend circle, somebody likely because the statistics are so high um, has, has experienced that. And so we're gonna look at this from two angles. One, from what the layperson sees in this because it predicts their behavior. And then two, how we approach this. And in how we approach this, it's not as simple as just giving Narcan where there's nuances that we need to discuss, okay? So let's dive into it. So how do opioids work? Well, opioids work by having a opioid molecule, right? It's a chemical that has a shape, fits a receptor site. Generally, this is in the central nervous system. And as a result, stimulates uh, um, the euphoria, so it stimulates first analgesia. Analgesia, analgesic means to relieve pain, so it, it's that's what it's intended to do. But then it also has the unintended effects of uh, euphoria, CNS depression, and then more than any other CNS depressant, though alcohol like is related in some ways to this, more than any other, this de depresses your ventilatory rate, depth, and effort, right? That's the big risk with an opioid overdose is the breathing's gonna stop. So it does that more pronounced than other CNS depressants. And that's all because of where these receptors are located. So opioids includes within it, right? The non-medical stuff like heroin, and then the medical stuff starting with morphine, which is most similar to heroin. They're very, very similar. In fact, the dose between the two is actually very similar if you were to convert it in the UK, heroin is actually a prescribed drug. Uh, we just, it's, it's illegal here for anyone to prescribe, but the UK does prescribe it. And so it's at that same level. And then there's synthetic uh, opioids that are more potent. And so some of those include drugs by names of like Darvon. Darvon is a synthetic opioid. It's more powerful than uh, morphine, but not as powerful as fentanyl. Fentanyl, if we're looking at order of magnitude, let's say that this is our base unit. So if this is a level of one, right, morphine and heroin, fentanyl is a level of 1,000. It's 1,000 times more potent than morphine in the same equivalent dosage. And then way down is carfentanyl. And that's 100,000 times more powerful than uh, our base opioid of morphine and heroin, right? So this is heavy duty stuff. So that means that it takes less of the more potent stuff for us to get a response um, in level of being overdosed. Okay, so know that they're synthetic and non-synthetic. Synthetic means that we made it, like completely just invented it out of combinations of chemicals. Non-synthetic means that it's created in nature. So mor morphine is a non-synthetic, heroin is a non-synthetic but they're all really derived from morphine. So in the United States, we talk about the lead drug of the opioid class actually being morphine and not heroin, but I want you to have them both in your mind because they're thinking in medicine, right? We don't give heroin. We're thinking in general population, heroin is, is the lead class for that. So here's some more uh, drug names that you can associate with the, um, the opioid system. Now, there are sometimes in drug classifications, nice things where the end or the prefix or suffix of the, the name of the drug gives you a hint to the class. And so often if you see the own, the own at the end of this, that does mean it's an opioid. However, there are some drugs that are not opioids. They're pretty rare. So I don't want you to worry too much about them. There are some non-opioid drugs that end in own. Primarily though, the uh, are synthetic opioids end in own. But obviously there's a few derivatives from that, mepridine, carfentanil, fentanyl um, as well. All right, so this list has kind of the names all paired together. You don't need to memorize the list, but I would like you to be familiar with things, as I mentioned, Darvon, Darvon, uh, morphine, obviously, fentanyl, and carfentanil. So those are what I'd like you to be aware of. And how are you gonna use these on the exam? You'll probably be given an, an exam question that says they overdose on a drug and you need to be able to know that drug is part of this class and then say, oh, okay, well, that's an opioid. So I can then expect to answer the question this way. Okay. So carfentanil, as mentioned, is the most powerful form of an opioid that's ever been made. It's man-made, it's, it's uh, synthetic. And so again, this is used on animals that weigh more than vehicles, more than cars, right? So of course, they're going to be much more potent. 
Now, carfentanil, fentanyl, uh, and the other um, derivatives, they may be in pill form. Certainly, that's one way that they can be given. But what's coming across the borders is usually not pills because we can see those through x-ray. Instead, it's in a powder form. And so literally, if I, if I want you to imagine this little cube that I'm drawing here is salt, right? So that's one salt cube out of your salt shaker. So imagine that size, right? The same size, one salt cube size of fentanyl by itself could be fatal. That small crystal could be fatal and that's fentanyl. Imagine now the same size crystal because they're basically formed in that same kind of powder constitution. Carfentanil is enough to kill multiple people. Like not that it would, it doesn't transfer from person to person usually, but that's how potent it is. So the risk is that we get exposed to these drugs as well. But the other side of it is, let me go back to this slide, Narcan, right? The opioid antidote in layman's terms are our competitive uh, narcotic uh, antagonist, um, naloxone was designed and its dosage is designed specifically for morphine, okay? So that means that if we have patients that have overdosed on fentanyl or been exposed to fentanyl or carfentanil, it takes much more of our Narcan to treat them because the Narcan doses we have and the stuff that we carry is constituted primarily for morphine and heroin. And so expect that when we get to carfentanil and fentanyl, we might be using up to, in some states, it's eight to 10 times more Narcan to get these patients to just bring up their ventilatory rate, not even wake them up. And Narcan doesn't generally last as long as carfentanil stays in the body. So at some point the Narcan wears out and we have to redose them. Otherwise they start getting the effects of the drug again. All right, so something to know in your field practice. Now, what you're learning for right now, that's still the minimum level of opioid dose, your drug guidelines that you're learning for right now, still the minimum level dose that we give in the pre-hospital setting, but we just know that the synthetic drugs often take more uh, Narcan to treat them. All right, so let's see. Patients develop tolerance quickly. So tolerance as a term from this section is very similar to tolerance when we talk about pharmacology in the sense that it means that your body, when you're exposed to this drug, we may develop a tolerance to being exposed to it in which it takes increasing amounts of the drug to get us the same effects. And so that's really at the heart of drug abuse is this idea called chasing the dragon. And the dragon is to say that when somebody gets high for the first time, the euphoria that they feel from that kind of virgin dose to them, they've never had anything in their body like it before, that dose that they get will cause a really pronounced high in a small dose. And so every other time that they try to take the drug, they're trying to get that high, essentially. But every time they take the drug, it takes more to get a smaller high, if you will. And so that produces the tolerance in which their body isn't going to respond to low dosage. It only responds to high dosage. And that puts the person then at risk that for some reason, they take just a little too much extra that they've been doing extra for a while, take a little too much extra, and that kind of over, uh, overwhelms their body and they go into a pronounced withdrawal. And so that's actually what leads to many of our cases of overdose when we arrive, is that they took extra knowing that they needed extra to get a better high, but they just overdid it for them. And there's no real way for them to tell, okay, if I do this dose, you know, let me do an increment of two more milligrams. It's not that precise. So it's easy to, for them, unfortunately, to overdo, overdo it. So this leads to massive overdose. Okay. Some patients require massive doses to get the same high is one way to say tolerance. Uh, and associated with this is often the patient's gonna have nausea and vomiting, and that equals for us an airway issue, right? Now, as a person progresses through their tox uh, intoxication, um, with an opioid, we should expect to see a few initial signs and symptoms, right? So their LOC is going to initially start to decrease from being intoxicated to being unconscious. Their ventilatory rate, we know decreases, but maybe you didn't know this. On the other side, I mentioned they can have a decreasing blood pressure. They may be tachycardic. And if you think about that, low blood pressure and tachycardia often looks like shock. And these patients often also have signs of diaphoretic, right? They're sweaty and pale skin. And depending on which degree or part of their overdose, their skin may be warm in the beginning, but will progress towards cool, clammy or wet and cold skin. So these patients can be found in kind of any spectrum. 
Now notice that on my list, I didn't put pinpoint pupils as a primary factor. So pinpoint pupils are an important component of this, but I want you to understand uh, why it's not the only vital sign that we use. And so pinpoint pupils literally means that their pupils are about one to two millimeter in size. They're constricted down as far as basically we can go. And so what's a normal pupil size? A normal pupil size is five to six millimeters. Their pupils will be equally constricted down to this level. However, pinpoint pupils is in early intoxication, okay? You will run on calls where patients are absolutely overdosed on an opioid and requires your treatment as such, but don't have pinpoint pupils. It's more common than you would think. So yes, pinpoint pupils in the early intoxication phase, but here's what happens. The patient's brain, when they decrease their blood pressure from being high and their ventilatory rate goes down, all the fit principles fail, right? So now we're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. You'll know this when you wake these people up with, uh, with Narcan and they wake up angry. That's actually called hypoxic rage and is essentially the result of them having no oxygen to their brain while they were high. And now they're basically, their brain isn't functioning well. So they perceive things in that simplistic form of, uh, is it a threat or not? And so uh, when the brain becomes sufficiently hypoxic, at some point, the person's pupils become dilated. Okay, so dilated means fully wide open. They're bigger than they should be. And that throws off a lot of students, especially in scenarios when we say, okay, this patient, you ask all the right questions, you get through everything, you even check pupils, the pupils are dilated. And everything else in your mind is like, okay, it's an overdose, in our, but they don't have pinpoint pupils, so I'm not going to treat it. Maybe it's a BGL thing, and they never give Narcan, and so they fail the scenario. <clears throat> and so it's very important you know that as the brain dies, as the brain becomes hypoxic, it causes the, the signals that are going to your pupils to keep them closed, dilated and constricted means opening and closing. So there's muscle use. The muscle of the pupil is working when they're pinpoint, but once their brain lacks enough oxygen to continue to tell the muscle to do that, the muscle completely relaxes, not just a little bit, it completely relaxes. And the pupils may end up fixed and dilated in very late positions of the patient's overdose. Fixed and dilated is always a sign of brain damage, often irreversible. So when you have a patient that is in cardiac arrest, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to survive CPR. And so unfortunately, at the end of everything you did, everything right, by the way, the patient's still dead, their eyes, their pupils will be fixed and dilated. So meaning they don't restrict, they don't move at all when you shine a pen light in. And that's a sign of brain death and often is also a sign of the patient being dead. So these patients could still be alive and have fixed and, di uh, fixed and dilated pupils, but that indicates that they're probably gonna, their heart's gonna die soon, but they may have irreversible brain damage as a result of the loss of oxygen that suffered because of these. So I want you to know the other signs and symptoms and certainly your, your history and looking around the scene for drug paraphernalia or needles and track marks on your patient, all valid. But again, the pupils aren't the primary source. So please don't get sucked into that. Narcan is, uh, again, can be called an antidote, but you know we're testing here, so let's use the testable term, a competitive narcotic antagonist, okay? And the competitive is important here. We have other antagonists in our scope of practice, but this is the only real competitive antagonist. So remember, this is all talking about the same old stuff as drugs, right? We have a receptor site. Here's my... Uh, opioid receptor uh, site and opioid molecule seems to fit. When they latch together, that causes CNS depression and high and decreased ventilatory rate, right? All that stuff we're with, cool with. In a normal antagonist, not a competitive, in a normal antagonist, let's say that here's our, our Narcan um, and here's a normal antagonist. So let's do our line through it. So normal. A normal antagonist is gonna have to wait until the opioid degrades, right? The drug wears off and it falls off the receptor site for the normal to go in and block it. However, Narcan has, is like a big old boot, right? It's gonna put a boot in that opioid's butt. And the idea here is that even if the receptor site is occupied by an opioid, the competitive means that Narcan really wants that receptor site and can literally force the chemical off the opioid prematurely, force it off the receptor site and then occupy that space. And the antagonist idea is when Narcan attaches to this space, it does not, 
right? It doesn't cause anything to happen. It blocks something from happening. So it does not produce the signs and symptoms of, you, of being intoxicated and it reverse, reverses those to the body's normal state. So they start breathing faster, they wake up, all those good things happen. So competitive means that it knocks off the opioid. That's an important um, distinction uh, when talking about Narcan. Now Narcan also has a short half-life. So I'm a short half-life relative to opioids. Half-life from pharmacology means that it's the length of time before it basically reaches its half effective dose. And so a drug, just like the chemical that's in our body that has, we have receptor sites for, it's designed to last only for a short period of time. Whatever, and all drugs are a little bit different. And so that drug will eventually degrade, fall apart, and then be processed outside of the body. When it gets to the point of the half-life, that's kind of telling us how long this thing works. And so I don't want you to necessarily memorize numbers here, but I want you to have the concept that opioids half-life is longer than narcotics half-life. So the scenario could be that the patient overdoses on the opioid. Let's say you've got a you know, 20, 30 minute transport to the hospital. You do everything right, identify it, you give Narcan appropriately, it reverses their high. It kicked off the opioid that was there, but the opioid didn't get degraded. So it's still active and it's not out of the body yet because its half-life is long. So it stays in the body active, ready to, to jump onto that receptor site and as soon as Narcan degrades and falls apart, naturally it happens faster than the opioid. The opioid is still there. And so it just reattaches. And so these patients go through, if we're not sensitive to their vital signs, they'll go through states of getting high, having to withdraw. When we wake them up, getting high, withdraw when we give Narcan, high, withdraw. And that by itself can predispose the patient to things like seizures and often actually make them more violent. Uh, when interacting with us because of that hypoxic state of their brain. So these patients, even if we've reversed their signs and symptoms, we need to assess every Q3 to five minutes because they can have a, down, a, a downward trend in their vital signs that we can catch early that can happen over just a few minutes once Narcan wears off. And Narcan's half-life generally uh, is a, up to 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so we're gonna be reassessing frequently enough that we'll know early before the Narcan wears off so that we can give Narcan again, knowing that we're replacing the stuff that's wearing out and they still have probably the rest of the opioid in their body, okay? Now, it's nice that we can give this in a few ways and this also deserves a discussion. When talking about giving Narcan, the preferred route is injection, right? I'm gonna state that from a medical point of view. The preferred route to reliably give the patient a set amount of drug and get a reliable response in a set amount of time is through injection, okay? That reliability is important. Intranasal is not injection. So remember, this isn't inhalation where we breathe it into our lungs for it to work. And literally when it touches our lungs, the drug starts working here. Instead, we're using the mucosal atomizing device to turn the drug, the Narcan fluid, into tiny droplets similar to inhalation, but we squirt it in their nose, it attaches to the inside of their nose and then absorbs through the inside of the nose into their bloodstream, okay? Now, if I inject something into a patient's body with a needle, then really they're gonna get the dose that I give them. So it's not like some uh, varying rate depending on the patient's constitution. That's really not the way it works. If I intend to give them 0.4 milligrams of the drug and I give it injected, they'll get the 0.4. However, with intranasal, there's lots of things that are in the way of us absorbing the drug. So those things include, is the patient's nose dry? Very likely New Mexico. Do they have a lot of mocos in there? Is it covered with boogers? Because the drug won't be able to go through the booger to get into the bloodstream uh, and will be delayed. Uh, what's their nasal mucosa like in general? And how many blood vessels do they have there? Were they all cauterized at some point because they had a bloody nose and they had to go in and burn the inside of their nose in which it won't go into any bloodstream because it's all scar tissue? Is it scar tissue because these patients snort other drugs? Uh, is it scar tissue for other reasons? And so the amount of drug that you give the patient in intranasal is not the amount of drug they get into their bloodstream. And you have no way to tell how much of what you're giving they will get. Hence, that's why we have a different dose for intranasal than injection. Why do we have intranasal then if it's such an unreliable means? It's safer in some ways, right? So intranasal, just in the story of kind of underscoring why intranasal, I personal, this is my personal preference uh, in practicality, uh, is to give an injection first 
if you go straight to intranasal and you do everything right with the same dose on testing, you'll be fine. But again, it may have an impact on your life in the field, like literally your safety in the field. So the idea here is that <clears throat> we originally only injected Narcan and a paramedic and intermediate can inject Narcan into the IV, a more reliable and expedient route, but not generally by that much compared to intramuscular. At some point in Española, New Mexico, we became the hotspot of drug overdoses. As, as drugs came, opioids came from Latin America across the border in Mexico, they would bypass Albuquerque and Santa Fe because of the heavy policing that goes on there. And they set up shop with the Mexican mafia and associated gangs all over the country in Española, New Mexico. Española had the highest rate of drug overdoses per capita for decades before, and they had basically an opioid epidemic for many, many years before. So many so that there were never enough EMTs on duty to run calls to fix this. And so patients died while they were waiting for an ambulance to go from one overdose to another. Intranasal was a means of us giving this to law enforcement. Okay, So that's why we actually got in our school practice. They added it to law enforcement officers that are first responders. And then that got automatically added to everybody else's scope. So I don't want you to think it's your first choice. The thing with intranasal Narcan is that if you give it, you give a higher dose, right? So it's one milligram of Narcan per nair for a total of basically the max Narcan dose in any injection for intranasal. That's what we give. And we just hope that they get some amount of that into their bloodstream. If they get the full dose though, if they have the perfect nostril and how would we ever know, if they have the perfect nostril and they get the full dose, they're gonna wake up very rapidly and likely violent and violent towards you. So you have no control to give them just enough not to make them violent when you give them intranasal Narcan, but you do have that control when you inject with IM and sub Q. All right, so in learning it, it is important that you learn to do different doses and how to do both of them. The preference here is that if your patient is fully unconscious and you're giving them Narcan, our goal is not to wake them up, okay? Please don't answer that as your goal on any exam, including in lab. Our goal is to increase their ability to breathe and to increase their airway maintenance. It's preferable that we don't wake up these patients that have overdosed on an opioid. A few reasons for this. Number one, if we wake them up, they're gonna be violent and that violence could put our life in danger. And guess what? We have needles laying around. And so it increases the likelihood for a needle stick if they get violent. Number two, if I wake them up, I technically put them into a withdrawal, right? Like I go from them being high to an opioid withdrawal. And you know, probably at least from layperson just knowledge and media and TV, opioid withdrawals can be de deadly as well. And so that's what we're causing is an immediate withdrawal. If we send them into full withdrawal sy symptoms, some patients, unfortunately, could have some bad effects of it. It's pretty rare, but it like it totally can happen. And the higher the dose, the more likely it is to actually happen. Not that we need to get in the weeds of all the things that happen. I don't want you to be afraid of Narcan, but I want you to be a responsible Narcan user or administrator in these patients. Okay. And then finally, if the patient in the field was sent into withdrawals, when they get to the hospital, the hospital is going to sedate them because they don't want them to go through the withdrawals. They're dangerous for the patient. They're dangerous for staff. And so they sedate them once we arrive. And so the preference, even in the hospital, is that we don't wake them up fully. So your goal in, in memorizing our management of patients and use of Narcan is to only bring their LOC up enough that they're breathing faster and they can protect their own airway. That's the goal. So we're going to do that in small steps with small injections incrementally until we get there and not one large injection. Uh, like we would do in intranasal. But by and large, most students don't, most patients don't get the whole two milligrams in their nose, but even getting one full milligram, if that was the, they got half the dose, that could pronounce uh, a scene safety issue for you and cause the patient to go into full withdrawals. Now, if the patient, if you give Narcan and you've woken them up enough that you think if you give them more Narcan, they might be violent, but they're still not breathing well enough, don't worry we can attack this from multiple angles. We do wanna give patients that are overdosed on opioids Narcan, no doubt about it. But our goal is to increase their ventilations and increase their LOC enough for their airway, not to wake them up. So if I'm on that edge and I've given enough Narcan where I think the next dose will wake them up, don't forget you can help their breathing by using a BVM. And these patients should have absolutely already had the BVM on them before we got, and why we're preparing Narcan and probably had basic airway adjuncts inserted as well. That should have happened while we we're drawing up the drug and doing all that fun stuff already, right? ABCs. And so just continue that if the patient's awake enough, 
that we think one more dose will cause them to wake up enough and be a, a, a seen issue. Sometimes though, when we get there, somebody's already given Narcan. So ask that about bystanders, though often when this happens, the bystanders flee. And so they may do the, the, the patient the solid of calling 911. Some go even further by giving Narcan in the, the kits that are just handed out nowadays. And others though, they'll do that and they'll take off. And so you may not know anything about how much what they ingested and whether they've had Narcan or not, but that may have been already given. Just remember, I'm likely gonna have to give more as we transport anyways. And these patients should never get a refusal. They need to go to the hospital to be evaluated for a number of things and monitored so that if they do have a more opioid in their system, they will still have the Narcan they need to kind of keep going. Okay, so don't forget that. Also a note on uh, Narcan and airway stuff. Remember that when we talked about hypoglycemia, I mentioned there's two times in which I might otherwise want to use a supraglottic airway, but I'm not going to because the effects of using that uh, supraglottic airway will cause risks when the patient wakes up. So the idea here being that in the two, th those two cases where I want to go to supraglottic airway, but let me hold off a little longer and use all the other devices for airway that I have are hypoglycemia because we're hopefully going to reverse it at some point. And when we reverse their hypoglycemia, their airway will be protected. They'll wake up and they'll try to rip it out, which may cause some damage to their airway. Patients that are overdosed on narcotics just narcotics though, not alcohol necessarily, not other sedatives, just narcotics because we have Narcan. We intend to reverse this. Once we reverse it, their airway will hopefully be open and self-maintained and they'll be breathing on their own. So I won't necessarily need to do that. And if they wake up, they'll just rip it out anyways. So we hold off a little longer. Again though, if I used all my Narcan and they didn't wake up and I'm not gonna get any more before the hospital, maybe then I need to use supraglottic airway, cases like carfentanil overdose. Uh, or if the patient, excuse me, uh, has a really long transport time in hypoglycemia before someone's going to do it. I might still have to use a supraglottic, but generally we don't go to that level. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk about another sedative type drug uh, that would also be kind of classified as a CNS depressant, right? And this is a toxidrome for sedative hypnotic drugs. And then we'll take a, a break here in a moment. So again, very similar to the way that we saw alcohol acute intoxication present, how overdoses present, Sedative hypnotics present the same way. And examples of sedative hypnotics are barbiturates and benzos. And benzos, benzodiazepines may not like resonate with you yet, but examples of benzos include Valium, Ativan, Versed, right? Like really heavy sedative drugs that are given in the hospital. And some of these drugs are often given just when you have to get a procedure done. For, for example, uh, those of you, when you get to the age of having to have the uh, camera and the pooper. Hopefully that you take a pill at that point that has a camera in it. But if you have to have a colonoscopy, they generally will sedate you. And they generally like to sedate with, with Versed because Versed particularly has a hypnotic effect with it. So hypnotic means that you have amnesia as a result of being given the drug. Patients uh, may have amnesia as a result of an overdose on alcohol and the overdose on, on um, uh, opioids, but when we're talking about medications that patients take, very few actually cause amnesia. And so these are pretty common in medicine, but they're also common in veterinary medicine. So that makes them a little easier to access and often very prolific in the illicit drug trade um, of our communities. So these patients are going to look basically intoxicated. And again, this is just another means of the drug basically causing, when it attaches to the receptor sites, a, a depressed response from the brain and spinal cord. So many of these drugs in the pre-hospital setting are going to be ingested. And so if it is ingested, you can consider activated charcoal for these and uh, in their pill form. And so again, just make sure their airways uh, stable enough that they can tolerate this without the risk of uh, aspiration, calculate it based on their weight. And when we give activated charcoal, it's not going to be pleasant. So you're going to have to talk the patients through it. Um, sometimes though, these could be IV injectables. And so some patients get these, especially when they're stolen from a facility, they can get them as injectables and they'll inject it in the same way that they may inject other drugs like uh, heroin. Some of the drugs that are used in the illicit trade that maybe are, there are certainly sedative hypnotics that are made completely as illegal drugs. They don't have a, a use in medicine, um, but they mimic basically this hypnotic effect. These drugs are sometimes given as the knockout uh, drug or um, the date rape drug. And so this is the classification of the drug that folks might put into a drink at a bar 
to sedate somebody and then influence them and co coerce them into having um, non-consensual intercourse. And so date rape drugs uh, fall within this classification, unfortunately, because of the hypnotic effects that it gives. Now, we don't have an antidote for this. We don't have an uh, antagonist for this. And so we're going to support signs and symptoms as we find them. So expect these patients will have a decreased LOC. So they'll have a decreased ability to maintain their airway. We're probably gonna have to manage airway in some way. The patients may also have breathing issues uh, uh, sedated. These don't necessarily cause ventilatory rates to slow down as quickly as opioids do, but they'll have a similar effect, unfortunately. So these patients may be hypo, um, uh, hypo, hypo, tech, hypo, uh, hypo, oh, I'm sorry, bradypneic. That's the term for slow breathing, braid, braid, yeah, slow breathing, tachypnea, fast breathing. So they'll have a slow ventilatory rate. All right. So let's stop here. Uh, we're going to take a break. The abused inhalants has some of them can cause central nervous system depression, but some of them can also cause like stimulant, the opposite of depression uh, of the central nervous system. And others do neither, but they produce other effects by the result of hypoxia. So we'll talk about the abused inhalants uh, in a few minutes. So let's come back at about 1030 and we'll continue that quest. So the abused inhalants, could have actually a number of different toxidromes within them. We're kind of just saying that this is something that somebody um, should generally not be inhaling. Um, it's not designed to be inhaled is generally the idea here. So this is stuff like folks that huff paint, right? They spray, spray paint into a bag and then they put the bag over their mouth and they breathe basically the fumes of the spray paint as a means of getting high. And so this certainly happens in a wide variety of age groups. And we do see this in, in uh, children and uh, teenagers as well. Unknowingly, what they're doing, the, re the way that they're getting the euphoric feeling is kind of the same way they get a euphoric feeling if on the playground somebody did one of those sleeper chokeholds on them, right? So I don't know if you ever experienced this, but a common means of getting bullied sometimes is somebody comes up behind you, they grab you around your throat, and in doing so, they're closing off, when they put their arm around your throat, they're closing off the blood vessels that feed your brain, your carotid arteries. And so your brain momentarily goes without oxygen. When it goes without oxygen, we tend to lose our consciousness. This happens abruptly. So suddenly we lose consciousness, we faint, and then kind of go down the ground. In between, some kids do it for fun because in between fainting, they start to get a euphoric feeling, almost being high. The reason for that is because of the lack of oxygen. So they're basically using hypoxia uh, in that case and in this case. How do they use hypoxia here? One way they get hypoxia is the patient is inhaling fumes that are in a bag that are replacing the oxygen we would get. And so we get those chemicals in our body, but we didn't get oxygen when we were doing it. And so we deprived ourselves of oxygen in that time period. The chemical itself may also produce a buzz effect or something like that, but hypoxia is often the result. The other way hypoxia can come about for us is some things that people inhale attach to our red blood cells and stop them from getting oxygen uh, in the process. And so it could be that the effect of in trying to uh, inhale is that not only did they get no oxygen when they were breathing it, now when they're not breathing it out of the bag, they're not going to get oxygen attached to their hemoglobin as well. And certainly worse things can happen beyond that. So common things, I mean, it goes down to even not just paint, but glues, uh, gasoline. And so this will be a really big area of trying to figure out what it was that they were inhaling. And do you, imagine, do you think they're going to want to tell you? Probably not, right? They're, they're probably going to be uh, a bit evasive in their answering. So we're going to have to build some rapport with them to get down to this. Managing these patients often associated with uh, problems with breathing. We could have airway issues, especially as their LOC goes down, but because of the lack of oxygen and the change in, in what, what they're breathing, especially some that kind of cause systemic effects and change the way we use or, or get oxygen in the body, um, their breathing is likely going to be elevated. They'll have an elevated work of breathing and probably going to require some oxygen on top of that. So support their breathing, support their oxygen needs, and obviously if their LOC is down, support their airway. Otherwise, we don't really have any good tools for this. We may need to consider if the patient um, is complaining of chest pain or have, has irregular heart findings, we may need to consider ALS so that they can do a 12 lead on the patient. Often the 12 lead EKG is something we reserve for patients having a heart attack, but we can use it for as a paramedic for anyone that has, we suspect, an abnormal heart rhythm, some of which you learned about recently. 
Uh, and so they'll be able to discern this ventricular dysrhythmia, which could be fatal. So ALS might be uh, on your list. Hydrogen sulfide uh, is a particular type of poison. Uh, it can be utilized in a lot of different cases. Mostly though, when somebody is exposed to hydrogen sulfide, um, it's inhalation of chemicals released accidentally, uh, unintentionally. So it's not something that someone's probably huffing to get to. If patients are taking in hydrogen sulfide intentionally, they probably intend to die. And they know what they're doing if they got to this type of, of, um, of chemical. And so uh, unfortunately, this is a very toxic gas that uh, we could easily be exposed to. Um, has an odor to it, unlike carbon monoxide, for example, which has no odor. Um, smells like sulfur, right? So that's that rotten egg odor that you smell if you're, for example, driving up in Hamas by the um, hummingbird camp. When you go by there, there's sulfur released in the environment. Uh, it smells like that. So usually this is an inhalation route. And unfortunately, it has its largest impact on some of our core organs. So it can be uh, fatal and toxic. We're gonna have to have a hazmat team go into the home or go into the environment where this is released because nothing that we have on an ambulance is appropriate PPE. So they need more PPE and training to tell us that we can enter the scene with less PPE and training. So it may be that we have to wait for hazmat to clear the scene for us, make the scene safe, before we can even manage treating our patient. Now, this is particular, particularly in here um, because of the risk of this being associated with suicide and the risk of just in, in chemicals, like chemical plants and processing plants and facilities and industry, um, hydrogen sulfide is used in a lot of different processes. So these patients will progress very similarly to what we've seen previously uh, with confusion, dyspnea, signs of shock, eventually their loss of consciousness goes to seizure, and that leads to uh, pulmonary arrest. These patients probably need ALS intercept as well. Sympathomimetics, so this is uh, another toxidrome. Sympathomimetics are stimulants. That's one way to think of it. So the effects that we saw in CNS depressants, those will be the opposite for CNS stimulants. So really this is basically a process of mimicking the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathomimetic, right? sympathetic mimics, right? Mimics the sympathetic nervous system. So this should be much easier for us to associate with vital signs because the question then becomes, what does the sympathetic nervous system do to the organs, the heart, the lungs, the vessels, the GI tract, right? Uh, uh, vessels, got that one, heart, lungs, uh, brain, all these things that we already know happen when the sympathetic nervous system is active, these things become the signs and symptoms that we're looking for in patients for sympathomimetics. So the whole thing here is the risk of their body's sympathetic nervous system is over dominant because of the chemical exposure. And you can see there's a lot of things that fall in this class that maybe you didn't, excuse me, necessarily have on, on your list. How will you want to use this to prepare for meaning the table of drug names to prepare for the exam. What do you need to memorize? I would memorize the big stuff. So I would memorize, oops, sorry. I'd memorize the uh, PCP, amphetamines, cocaine, crack cocaine is amphetamine. So amphetamine is gonna be probably one of the areas that the questions will focus on for sympathomimetics, but no cocaine, uh, amphetamine, methamphetamine, things of that nature. The other stuff that's on here, like Adam and uh, MDA, those things, are certainly possible on the exam, but not very likely, all right? So hopefully you can kind of narrow it down to what you need to focus on. So the big street stuff that everybody's aware of, methamphetamines, cocaine, so on. So <clears throat> the excited state that's produced here is literally because they had a release, the drug caused essentially a release of epinephrine or, or adrenaline from the body's endocrine system or something that mimics the epinephrine um, in the body. And so all of these effects that we're aware of for the sympathetic nervous system though are on overdrive. So for example, it probably doesn't come to surprise you that if a patient overdoses say on cocaine, their heart rate is gonna be elevated, their blood pressure will be elevated, all these things will be elevated, but their heart rate could be elevated so high that the patient's heart causes basically its own heart attack. We ask it to work in the range of like 180, 200 plus beats per minute. Somebody uses too much cocaine and the heart isn't gonna be able to meet that need even if there's not a lot of coronary artery disease. So this might cause a patient to have a heart attack in a very young age. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't suspect would have a heart attack. Uh, as, as well as the heart attack, as well as dysrhythmias and cardiovascular collapse, certainly nervous system problems can come up as well. And so these patients are gonna be usually pretty anxious, agitated, 
Um, their neural conduction rates fast, and so they may not process complex things very easily. Uh, and the patient can progress, obviously, to having a seizure. But yeah, drugs are bad. All right, so in the next few slides, it talks about every individual drug. I'm going to leave that for you to review because we're looking at kind of the uh, overall management of sympathomimetics. So when we see these patients overdose, the risk is, again, and how we treat them is support signs and symptoms, treat A, B, C, D, E issues as we find them. Okay. So though we don't have a lot of treatment for these patients, that means we probably need to transport them rapidly to somebody who does. And so I would consider in some, uh, sympathomimetic ALS as being your intercept. They have some drugs, again, that can help with our seizures, and, and basically they can sedate the brain in the case that the sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive, though we don't have a whole lot that can, that can manage this. Okay. Synthetic Cathinines, cathinones, um, are basically the medical name or the chemical name for bath salts. And so bath salts are things people can buy just over the counter kind of head smoke shop type uh, um, organizations. And they're not really well regulated. They kind of fall within technically the FDA's purview of it would be within the supplements realm. So not something used to diagnose or treat but everything else someone claims to use, that's how it is. So the problem though, is that individual states are trying to make these illegal. And the reason for that is a lot of people that do bath salts have really very catastrophic changes in their perception of reality. Like it really messes up their brain. So for example, do you remember uh, a few years ago, a few might be um, a lot, uh, a few years ago, there was a guy that was in somewhere in, in Florida and he was called a zombie. He was a homeless gentleman that was on the side of the road in the midday filmed. So there's video of this filmed eating a guy's face, like literally off the guy, like biting and taking chunks of this guy's face uh, on the side of the road in pure, pure uh, plain view of everybody. That person, that zombie that was eating the face, I believe died as a result of that. He was shot, I think by police, but that zombie state, that zombie state was the result of bath salts. And so this generally causes not just a big break in reality, right? So it would technically be something along the lines of delirium, right? Break with reality. So hallucination certainly can happen, but it makes these folks similar to some other drugs like angel dust, for example, it makes people feel invincible. And so in that feeling invincible, they often don't feel pain as a result of the intoxication. So certainly they can get shot and keep going. They seem to exhibit superhuman strength sometimes uh, as a result of the intoxication, like might be able to, to struggle away from five or six police and firefighters, you know, in shape, struggling to hold them down. Some people have been shot multiple times, including in the heart and not died until the blood pumped out of their body. And so kept charging the police. And so this can be a really big scene safety issue, even in the back of your ambulance, uh, if we've got them subdued. And so it mimics in a lot of cases, you'll see that sometimes some of the symptoms are gonna actually mimic, mimic our sympathomimetics. More specifically, teeth grinding, appetite loss, muscle twitching. These are things we see with amphetamines. Hence the relationship to their uh, sympathetic nervous system being in overdrive. Consider ALS intercept, but these patients are a huge safety issue. So you may need to restrain them, unfortunately. All right, we're gonna skip that. The marijuana, so this is um, generally considered <clears throat> In the classifications, often it's put within the CNS depressant uh, realm, but it's worth discussing for a lot of reasons. One, it's the most abused drug in the world, even though it's being um, legalized. Uh, before that, when it was medical marijuana, it was still very heavily abused by those that didn't have medical marijuana cards. So now that New Mexico actually celebrates to uh, yesterday actually was the first day of um, general marijuana sales to the public, uh, it still becomes an issue for us. Just as alcohol certainly is available for people to purchase over the legal limit and people to consume and consume in large volumes, but we just know that it causes so many problems and for us so many calls in EMS, marijuana unfortunately is very similar. Now the difference though is that in the intoxication here, 
the CNS depressant effects aren't exactly the same as alcohol or opioid intoxication. And so sometimes people might have better reaction speed or normal reaction speed um, with uh, marijuana intoxication, but not be perceiving things. And in other cases, people will be completely catatonic. So it has an impact on patients, or now we could say, I guess the, the individual has an impact on the individual that varies depending on their personal tolerance. You do develop tolerance to marijuana and the doses that they're taking. You know, they may be never had marijuana before and they go and buy their first magic brownie, if they eat that whole thing, it's probably many, many milligrams of marijuana and probably going to cause them to go to a, a state of crisis. They might even flip out. Generally though, the long-term effects of marijuana use, aside from the effects of smoking, uh, right now, there's not a lot of evidence that suggests that it's ultimately very harmful. However, there's just not a lot of studies on it. So we just, we really don't know because the federal government still has a blockage on being able to support uh, funding on, and research on marijuana. Now, this is also important to you, especially now that marijuana is made uh, or decriminalized, right? Uh, made legal. So just for your knowledge, obviously you had to get a drug test to come here to go into our clinical setting. That's the same drug test that your um, agencies are going to provide for you. The problem here is that although the state may legalize it, and even if you were a medical marijuana patient, obviously this has been a thing for years, uh, the state doesn't have control over federal law. And so the federal law still exists that it's criminal to even for medical purposes to ha have marijuana. How does this relate to you? Well, Every hospital, every fire department, every EMS system receives money from the federal government. And when you receive money from the federal government, you're required to follow the federal government's laws, employment laws, including that marijuana is a source of intoxication. And if you're abusing drugs, including marijuana, though it may be legal in individual states, it's still not permitted for your employment. And so hospitals have already gone through the state Supreme Court on this. It's made case law. So it's very easy for judges now to pass this. If you were to be fired from your job, even if you had a medical marijuana card, when you went and urinated and tested positive for marijuana, even though legally New Mexico, you can have it, they can fire you from your job with no recourse. You can't get your job back because the federal government mandates that you can't um, test positive for drugs during employment. So this is an important area of contention that, you know, unfortunately our politics needs to fix. And so no, the answer was generally going to be right now, at least until something major happens, most hospitals, EMS and fire services do not allow you to use uh, marijuana medical or otherwise. And if you test positive on a test, one of the random urine screens for the ambulance of the hospital, they'll fire you uh, for that. So um, it didn't make our lives easier necessarily in that realm for first responders and medical providers. Okay, so know about marijuana. Some of you probably have more experience uh, and knowledge of its effect than others, so I'll leave that to your review. What do we do for this? What do you think we do? Support ABCs, treat signs and symptoms. The good news, though, is most patients, even if they feel like they're going to die, often because the edibles have such high THC concentration, you're talking like, let's see, I think the normal dose is like 10 milligrams for THC is in medical marijuana world. So when patients uh, get like a brownie, I wanna say it's like multiple doses. So could be what, 100 milligrams, 10 times more potent. So folks can take edibles and get themselves into a, such a, uh, an extreme high that it looks like maybe they're high on other drugs, but they're just flipping out um, because of the effects of marijuana on that person. The good news is often those don't lead to long-term bad effects as far as our research suggests so far. All right, and there's lots of ways people get uh, marijuana into their system. Synthetic marijuana is a problem though. Uh, we're seeing less and less of this as states legalize it, but the synthetic marijuana is again, kind of potent and physically the chemical resembles THC. It's not as equivalent as saying like morphine resembles heroin. Um, this type of drug generally still legal in many places, this type of drug doesn't give the exact same high. And often this drug is mixed with bath salts or other chemicals that users maybe don't or not are aware of. So if they have overdosed or taken spice and called us, think to look for the, the, the um, container if they have it available and figure out if there were bath salts or something similar inside of it. How would you know? Again, poison control can be helpful if you know the brand name. All right, <clears throat> hallucinogens, another classification, another toxidrome. So hallucinogens, their, their core thing, their core function, once the chemical attaches to a receptor in our body is to create hallucinations. So this is different than the other toxidromes where we said hallucinations are part of the signs and symptoms. 
the hallucinations there are side effects of the, the class of that toxidrome, but not the primary function, meaning not everybody necessarily gets them. These drugs, though, their primary thing is to cause hallucination. So if you take it, you're likely to hallucinate, not as a side effect, but as a primary uh, example. Now, when somebody overdoses or even takes small amounts of hallucinogens, they go into that break or dissociated state with reality. Again, I'm saying it again because it's totally testable. Delirium, right? Break in reality. So hallucinations often follow. This brings rise to what we do with hallucinations. So if we have patients that are complaining of hallucinations, it may be a drug issue, but it could also be like a, a brain issue, no drugs involved. Uh, so when managing it, it's important that we take the stance that what they think they're seeing is real. We don't wanna play along with it, but we don't wanna dismiss it either or, or we'll lose rapport with them. Now, playing along with it is hazardous to you, right? So the idea here is if you play along and pretend like you see their hallucinations, it's gonna reinforce that reality to them. And maybe the hallucination to them is, is terrifying. And so it could cause real physiologic symptoms, but also it, that person doesn't see reality the same way. If you paint a different picture than reality for them or help them paint that picture, maybe they now see you as a threat. And so it could put your life in danger when you play along with hallucinations. So be understanding and compassionate, but say, no, actually that's not there. I don't see it. Um, I think you're, you know, and be honest, I think you're hallucinating. Patients may not believe that answer because what they see looks more real than reality is often how they'll describe it. So, you know, manage by not making them aggravated as a key thing. Now, often the hallucinogen was taken intentionally so they could have a good trip, but sometimes we get the bad trip. And a bad trip is when the person basically is experiencing a nightmare in the form of their hallucination and not some, you know, happy, prancy story. Um, the patient, the uh, agents that were listed on that previous slide um, are often illegal agents, but they're readily available. For example, um, muscarin, you can find in mushrooms in Hamas, you can find uh, mescal, right, growing on uh, cow pies in outside of Rio Rancho. Um, you can find hallucinogen uh, drugs growing in weeds, probably in your neighborhood. Right. And people are aware of these. It's all over the Internet. So unfortunately, these folks have ready access to hallucinogens. It's not as hard to get as, say, the harder drugs, if you will. So as a result, though, often with that bad trip, again, the perceived break of reality, their delirium, their hallucinations, the physical effects will include hypertension, uh, tachycardia and anxiety. And so this kind of mimics often a sympathetic response. But again, that's a side effect. Their core effect is hallucinations. And hallucinations are actually being prescribed more. Uh, magic mushrooms can be prescribed in certain states to treat depression, um, as can uh, some of the, the mescalins. LSD has been used in research for years and years and years and is an approved therapy and in hospital behavioral health. So it, there, these drugs certainly could be used as medications as well, but they're pretty well managed and controlled. So we see this as illicit drug use. What do we do? Support, signs and symptoms, treat A, B, C, D, and E. Anticholinergic, an important toxidrome, okay? Anticholinergic, anticholinergic against the cholinergic nervous system, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? So the adrenergic nervous system is the sympathetic. The cholinergic nervous system is the parasympathetic, a new, a new name for it. Now, this is an interesting area because we actually do have some drugs to help treat us when the parasympathetic nervous system is out of bounds. That's, there's a particular drug in our school of practice. Um, so we'll work through this uh, in a few different ways, okay? So here's a little saying that'll help you memorize the actual signs and symptoms associated with an anticholinergic agent. So anticholinergic means that instead of stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, we're blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Anti, we're blocking the parasympathetic nervous system. So as a result, we kind of get the, the, I don't know, benefit byproduct of the sympathetic nervous system being more pronounced. Not fully, maybe not as dominant as symp sympathomimetics, but more pronounced than it would normally be because we're, the drug blocked the, uh, the cholinergic or parasympathetic nervous system. So these patients often are going to have sympathetic-like signs and symptoms to some degree, but it then also has an impact on their LOC that produces essentially hallucinations as a byproduct, right? So this is a toxidrome itself, anticholinergic agents, that as a byproduct produces the hallucinations. And then we'll also get some things like the patient 
gets a, uh, often these are blocking the histamine effect of allergic reactions. So actually Benadryl is an anticholinergic. And if someone overdoses on Benadryl, these are the signs and symptoms that they'll have. And why would somebody over, overdose on Benadryl? It's probably not because their nose is running. Literally, uh, patient, kids, let's just be frank, kids are out there trying to find different ways to get high. And they, there's plenty of places that announce the idea that if you take too much Benadryl, an overdose on Benadryl will produce hallucinations. And so literally you'll be going on calls as we all have, where kids have gotten hold of a bunch of Benadryl from you know wherever, Costco, and taken multiple grams of it. And most Benadryl is 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams. Like literally that's the dose in a bottle for every pill. They take hundreds of pills and get grams of Benadryl in their system and have this effect. So memorizing this will help you get the signs and symptoms for an anticholinergic agent. Oh, and then Jimson weed, that's a weed that's grown locally, very easy to find in almost every neighborhood in the West, in the Southwest. And so folks will just take this and make a tea out of it. And as a result, they'll, they're doing this for the hallucinations and euphoria, but they'll also have the anticholinergic system, uh, symptoms. And so the big risk here is that this is gonna overdrive the brain and the cardiovascular system, kind of like the sympathetic nervous system can overdrive it because it's winning here. And so the response that we're gonna have is be on edge for changes in the LOC that convert crest to a seizure. The patient can have um, abnormal heart rhythms, could have a heart attack. So we definitely wanna consider transporting this patient to ALS. Because they have a break with reality, they're gonna hallucinate most likely. It also may be that these patients um, could be violent. And when they're violent on anticholinergics, these folks tend to have that extra power and can fight really hard uh, before they just kind of go limp. Cholinergic agents are kind of the opposite, right? So if anticholinergic was to say blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, the cholinergic agents stimulate the cholinergic or the parasympathetic nervous system. So these are basically parasympathomimics, medics, right? Mimics, they mimic the parasympathetic nervous system. So the idea here now is whatever this substance is, it basically has shut the parasympathetic nervous system into overdrive, blocking the sympathetic nervous system. So all those effects of not the fight or flight, but the feed and breed or rest and whatever uh, uh, memorization tools we have for it, whatever it is, it's the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. So again, recall in your mind, what does that mean for the heart, vessels, lungs, GI tract, right? Now we don't have a lot of things for this, right? In our previous experience, we haven't done much with medications that will cause this to be on overdrive. We haven't done a whole lot in pharmacology with cholinergic agents. And so though we've done a lot with sympathetic, let's take the time here to, to, to kind of define what happens in these areas with the parasympathetic. So the heart rate is gonna go down as will cardiac output, which means their blood pressure goes down as well. But the heart rate goes down, remember, if the blood pressure goes down in most patients, the heart rate goes up to try and bring up their blood pressure. But here, the parasympathetic nervous system brings down both of those and it's dominant. So there's not a reflex to try and fix things. The blood vessels are going to vasodilate, right? So that causes a decrease in blood pressure. The lungs cause bronchioconstriction. Right, same thing we saw in asthma and in anaphylaxis. So bronchi restrict and it creates more mucus and swelling, right? Doesn't that sound familiar? That's uh, our asthma in a nutshell. GI system is gonna increase how fast it works. So we call that increased motility. So these folks are going to poop more and it's gonna be waterier, waterier and they'll create more mucus, including in their mouth. So they'll have a lot of saliva. They're gonna increase their um, gastric juices. So it increases their emesis. They're gonna likely vomit. And these folks vomit kind of like I described the syrup Ipecac folks that vomit like large amounts under high pressure. And so all of these signs and symptoms, we actually have an acronym to, to learn to put these into a box for us because cholinergic agents are another name for nerve agents or nerve gases. And we do have a drug for the nerve agents or nerve gas in the scope of practice. Now, often we're not responding if we use this drug to a nerve agent exposure. A nerve agent exposure is a term used for weapons, weapons of mass destruction. So nerve agents are generally gases that are released into the atmosphere by bombs or missiles. And those gases then spread the cholinergic agent and the individual people when nerve agents are used, they die 
as an overdose of the parasympathetic nervous system or overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's an agent of war. Now we have those in New Mexico, we research those in New Mexico. So it's possible, though that's not what usually happens for us to use the kit. So the, the common route of cholinergic for us is gonna be agricultural uh, agents. And so organophosphate is another term for cholinergic agents, another term for nerve agent. And organophosphates basically cause this, but in insects. And so organophosphates are usually um, the type of chemical that's in insecticides that are used in high doses on farms and agriculture. And so these could be stored at sites, they're sold at stores. And generally, if the person has physical contact with the fluid, it will be absorbed through their skin like it is in the insect and then have the effect. So if we see cholin cholinergic agent um, toxidrome present, it's probably because of the organophosphate overdose, but really the same effects would all be from nerve agents or otherwise. All right, so the, the uh, acronym that we have to help memorize this, uh, there's two of them, there's sludge. And that's something that kind of is used more locally. And then there's dumbbells. And so uh, I would encourage you to memorize both, but they basically have very similar components, right? So a sludge on the next one, yeah, there's sludge. So uh, I'd encourage you to memorize both of these, but I'll generally just refer to sludge in this process. But basically we're speaking the same language, okay? So let's go through both of them and define what we're seeing. So the patient will have diarrhea because of the increased GI motility. And if they have diarrhea, doesn't that lead to, if it's like a lot, they keep pooping, like constantly watery, that's gonna to lead to shock, right? Dehydration or hypovolemic shock. Urination, right? So they're urinating more frequently, contributes to shock. Meiosis, and so this is uh, the term that's associated with their change in pupils. Usually this will be dilated. Bradycardia, the B here, bronchospasm and bronchorrhea. So bradycardia, slow heart rate, we know that. Bronchospasm, that's the thing that in uh, asthma patients causes wheezing, right? Not all wheezing is bronchospasm, but bronchospasms produce wheezing. And then bronchorrhea. So when you see the term rhea, it's very similar to diarrhea. It means runny. So bronchorrhea means runny lungs or increased mucus production. But this is also could be associated with rhinorrhea, another term for this, another use of this term, rhinorrhea. Rhinorrhea, rhinorrhea means runny nose. So increased mucus production in the whole body, right? So the GI tract, the mouth, the respiratory tract, everywhere we're creating a bunch of mucus. The patients are gonna have GI upset, so emesis or vomiting. Lacrimation, so lacrimation specifically is the medical term for tears. So they'll have excess tearing. And then that can lead to patients They'll certainly have a lot of salivation, a lot of sweating, all, as you can imagine, contributing to shock, salivation contributing to airway issues, this contributing to breathing issues, and then seizures finally will uh, eventually lead to cardiac arrest. Okay, so the gist of a cholinergic agent overdose is that the, the parasympathetic nervous system drowns us in our own fluids and causes us to lose all our fluids, sending us into shock, and that's generally how we will die. So sludge basically has the same things, just in a different acronym. So salivation is sweating, check, lacrimation. Remember, this is tearing. So their eyes will be running. Urination, all contributing to shock and airway issues. Defecation, drooling, diarrhea, <clears throat> gastric upset and cramps, emesis. And then sludgeum is muscle twitching and meiosis, right? Again, the size of the pupils. So when we see these, these indicate, sludgeum and dumbbells, they indicate an organophosphate overdose or exposure, which is a cholinergic agent exposure, which is also a nerve agent. Be the same signs and symptoms. If you'd like to see these symptoms, uh, you can watch some old videos, just search for uh, uh, organophosphate or ner nerve agent tests in the US. And you can find some old black and white videos where they tested the nerve agent on uh, things like goats and pigs and birds. And you can see the, the things that are happening in the patient's, uh, those particular test subjects' bodies. And you can clearly see that it's basically the sludge or dumbbell set of things. Um, if that's something you're interested in, those are all available like anything else horrific uh, on YouTube. Okay, so the most important consideration here is usually the nerve agent gets in through inhalation or absorption. 
you could certainly ingest it. That, that's always the case if something can be absorbed, but <clears throat> or really injected. But the the common route is usually it's in the air or the person got soaked in a bottle of organophosphate. Maybe they were transferring over to their tractor tank to go spray. Like that's a good scenario for organophosphate overdose. And so if we come into contact with that fluid or it's aerosolized in the air, we're gonna suffer the same effects. So um, it, there's a great story, hopefully someday maybe someone can tell you, but Bernalillo County in the early nineties had a huge organophosphate exposure. And that organophosphate exposure caused virtually every EMT, police officer and firefighter on scene to become uh, exposed to the cholinergic agent. I mean, there's stories of EMTs literally transporting themselves to the hospital while their eyes are running and they can feel their lungs filling up with fluid. And they got there, you know, just in time transporting themselves, just kind of miraculous stuff. So this actually does happen and causes exposure. So hazmat teams are gonna be necessary uh, in this. Will you know that from dispatch? Maybe not. So hopefully you see the signs and symptoms. you put the pieces together very kind of quickly to limit your time or exposure on scene. There is an antidote kit. It's basically called a duodote. So it has two injections in it and they're literally marked one and marked number two. And so it tells you which order to use these in and they come in a pouch that has them packaged together. And so the, the technical name for this is called the mark kit. And the mark kit, that's nice to know, but what you really need to know are the two drugs that are in it because they're in your school practice. Two PAM, or you, and you can use that term or prilidoxamine and atropine. These are the two drugs that we give for this. Now, it's important that you know that we need both of them together, not individually, okay? So uh, we need 2-PAM and atropine. And what's happening here? Well, uh, long story short, here's your uh, organophosphate. We'll say here's your OP. Here's your receptor site, right? When this happens at the parasympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, when this happens at that point, this naturally would cause a neurotransmitter, which is actually what's gonna be attaching to this receptor site, causes a neurotransmitter to be released. And your body basically has a little Pac-Man type thing in here that will eat up the neurotransmitter that's not used. So any excess, the body eats up. Well, unfortunately, it's, it's technically an enzyme, but unfortunately what happens when the person has an organophosphate overdose is they flood the whole area with that neurotransmitter. So it causes the body to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and overdrive and it blocks the work of the Pac-Man that breaks it down. And so now all the extra will just sit there until it all gets used up. And so the person constantly has these symptoms until it gets out of the system. So here's what we have to do. We have to give one, something that basically blocks, atropine blocks, it's an anticholinergic. So it blocks the parasympathetic. So that buys us time. The rest of the spelling there. That buys us time. But really 2PAM is essential because 2PAM activates the thing that breaks down the neurotransmitter. So I think it's called an acet its classification is a acetylcholinesterase uh, um, reactivator, acetylcholinesterase reactivator. That's the name for Pac-Man here. And so it turns this on. So we could block the parasympathetic nervous system, but atropine doesn't last forever. The way to stop this from recurring is to turn on that Pac-Man. And so 2PAM is essential. Realize though, if we're doing this, this patient probably has a massive dose of it. So we often have to have ALS involved and maybe other units because if you need the mark kit, it's actually designed for you. The patient's gonna need multiple mark kits. And so the mark kit technically is something you use on yourself if you get exposed, but hopefully you don't get exposed. So you can use it on your patient, but they're gonna need multiple of them most likely. Um, so often we need more resources for these patients if they're producing that. So the rest of this list basically has a whole bunch of other drugs on it and signs and symptoms and management points. But again, they're all associated with treat the problems that are produced as ABCs and transport them somewhere after we've identified the poison and made sure that we're safe. So the rest of these are not really necessarily going to be important toxidromes. We covered the important toxidromes. So that's where I'm going to stop for our toxicology discussion. All right. So again, the toxidromes are heavily represented, and that's exactly what you're going to be doing in your scenario. Your scenario will give you the signs and symptoms as you assess the patient, that if you know it's a poisoning, you can then step back from it and say, okay, all these signs and symptoms tell me which toxidrome is in, in place. And if you memorize the toxidromes and what's in place, even if you don't recognize the drug name the, uh, that you're given that they overdosed on, 
then you'll have an idea of how to treat them because you'll know it's either sympathetic systems overdrive, so opioid overdose, which you can treat, uh, maybe it's an organophosphate, which you can treat, so on and so forth. Others we have to transport to the hospital. So you're going to get this as a drip fed. Here's this vital sign that you got. Here's that vital sign. But step back and put the pieces together if you suspect it's a poisoning. And then that suddenly gives you all the answers you need to successfully manage that patient and win the scenario over.